putting in the sprinkling system and uh, Lowell and Brian and Sully is working on this and uh, got all the holes all dug up as you can see and Sonny Boy sent us all the pipes we ordered it through him and the PVC and over there we're going underneath the fence now as we go into the backyard you can see that our boss is still here watching us she's on our case all the time making sure we're doing the right things and carrying out the work oh lucky 99 And there's all the stuff that was sent down by Sunny Boy. Still got a lot of stuff in here too. All the fittings and this is where the water will come from, from the front of the house. And then it'll come through here and then down through here underneath the fence. And then all the way the back of the house as you can see okay. Okay. okay as we follow we'll go all the way up in the back the trench there all the way from here and there'll be another box right there and then it'll come into here and the pipes all laid out in here okay Just a Of course, the boss is right there watching us as we taking pictures. I'm lucky.
That's what it looks like in the construction. And like I said, Low, Brian, and Sally is doing this job for us. And we ran out of pipe, so we gotta go buy some more and and uh for the small yard. But a lot of work. A lot of work involved. Really grateful for these guys doing this service project for us. <laughs> really appreciate them. Thank you, Lowell. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Saleh. Thank you guys for your help. We can look at this and know where. Okay. That's right there. The walkway. Lucky, come here. here. Yes. Lucky, did you get our lucky? Oh yeah, all the time. Lucky, come here. Are you looking at the pipes in the ground? Yeah. You're inspecting? She looks like an inspector. I well, know, that's why I called her the boss. She's the boss. The boss is looking at her ground. Lucky 99. Where is this all going now? Will I have a free bath every day? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, she loves that. When I turn on the, the sprinkler inside, she just... Oh, she's going to have a heyday back here. Oh, yeah. She sees the water go on. Oh, my gosh. She's going to fly through the sprinklers. Mm-hmm. Yep. That. There's mom. Beautiful mom. No, not beautiful. Just got home from work from Max Out. Right there. My big boobs. Fitness yep, center. Yep, they're off for you children. <laughs> <laughs> you kids ate from these things. I know. Mm -hmm. Drained it dry. <laughs> <laughs> it's flat as a board. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can see we're going to the fence over there too. Right under the fence. We look so beautiful, you know, honey, up in here. Mm -hmm. When we get the grass down, and yeah. man, this is going to look so nice. Look at this tree, the shade. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay, is that your video, a new one? Or yeah, uh-huh. That's what it looks like. I'm doing the sprinklers. All the pipes.
by the trees. And there's the boss. Yeah, this alongside the house is where the box is going to go. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these. Okay. And they're all hooked up like that. And then that goes straight up. Okay. And this is where the pipe is laid, so in case I know. Okay. Down here. Comes right out there. Right out there. Okay, this is the piping from the front sprinklers. And that's what was put in by the old guys for the front yard. And this is what Lo then put in the backyard. And go down on the fence. And as you see. Okay. That's where the pipe is. Side of the house, and we'll go all the way in the back, and it comes out to here, and then it goes all the way up here. Okay. Hey, can you cover that hole up, please? Yeah. <laughs> so that we can connect the backyard with this yard here. Okay. Hmm, that's the way it looks with the covers on it. Look at Lucia, Lucia and Grandma. Malia and Grandma, and she's almost a month old today of September 10th. Lucia Malia. Oh, honey. Malia. That's her little body. Her mommy's sleeping. It's 11 o'clock at night. Sally will be coming home pretty soon to get her. She's been wide awake. Oh, hey. Love sleeping on Grandma. Oh, there she goes, yawning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And today is September 10th, 1999. Yeah. And it's. Ray of Sunshine is a month old, and in two days, Malia will be a month old. Ten after ten.
Ten after eleven. Oh, ten after eleven. Okay. And this is a Friday night. Tears. Is... <laughs> Irene is so tired. And there's a billionaire. There's the contractors, the three contractors that. <laughs> the three musketeers. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, Lois turning on the water, and we're gonna see. Um, yeah, look at that! Hey, first, oh. hey. first time turning on. Look at that! Hey. Yeah, I still think there could have been one right in the middle. Honey, right here. Shh. no, that's good enough. Yeah, we'll like, still gotta adjust it. Oh, yeah. That's one section. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's nice, though. That was beautiful. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's one valve. One, one. That's just one valve. That's the only, that's a good one I know. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> um. Mm, all the other valves. It's one, now the other one. Man, that's good, yeah. That's good. Two is good like that. What we should do is mark two and two. Put two twos, two one ones. We can run the tree and the other one outside here. That way the thing is a little bit lower. Man. I yeah. think we need to run this one with one of these. Yeah. Just so it doesn't hit the fence quite as That'd be good. Yeah. Instead of having these two run together, we'll have these two run together. I think you have done it. <laughs> okay. This is the side of the road. And we just tried all the sprinklers inside and it looks good. And it just got through. Putting this one in. And there's a pipe all the way down. Okay. It looks like. As you notice, we got to go into a bigger pipe. And that's going over where the cars will be coming back and forth over the driveway. So, and this is another water release so that the pipes don't get full of water. And just let it all out. Maybe, maybe might need to close this uh, when it's open. Yeah, the pressure, so I have. Yeah, now it's coming low. Now you got water coming out. There we go. It's clean? Yeah. Yeah. I got it. I think it's just funneled out that one. These are the rules of Max's Dance Club.
sunlight. Good rules. Roger, Max. that he like to leave with you folks and the ones that pick up the leaf he will be your friend but if you don't pick up the leaf i feel sorry for you there we go the haka from new zealand
Some uh, hula dancers from outside there to do a Tahitian. We'd like to have uh, audience participation and we'd like to have the girls go outside there and pick a couple of them. Irene. Here we go. Go, <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> Thank you. 
We'd like to thank all of you from the bottom of our hearts. Aloha! Aloha! Thank you very much. Just got through raking it so we can spray the dirt with the grass Monday. So that's what it looks like. Tavers. Tavers. Two minutes, especially with, with the seed. You don't want to wash away the yeah. seed. Damn. You just got to keep it moist. The seed's not on there though yet, huh? No. Yeah, you figure that thing would fill up pretty fast. Yeah. That'd be nice though too. Once you get grass in there, just turn it on and go lay in there. Mm -hmm. Checking out the different water stations. Okay, today we had Supreme Green come inside and spray the grass, the seeds in our yard. And that's why it looks like this. And this is what it looks like. Okay. And Supreme Green is our bishop, American Seventh Ward, Bishop Roland, and we said to let it dry first. It's going to dry, and then water it again. We got grass already. The color of it. And look at who's here. The boss. She's right there. Lucky, get out of there, Lucky. Lucky. Lucky, get out of there. What it looks like. Lucky!
just lucky you don't keep eating this stuff, he might end up dying. Maybe this thing is poison or what. But that's what it looks like. Chase her out of here so she don't eat the grass. This monkey always trying to get in the act. Lucky 99. So it looks. Now we just gotta pray for grass. Mr. Roland sure looks like you did a good job. Appreciate it. Price on this was four twenty, four hundred and twenty dollars. Here we got Dad in the distance. Tracking his way through. Max is on his way to meet up with Dad. <laughs> I am, Mom. The support crowd. Dad! Clay is going to be running the last 10 miles with Dad. Here's Tia! Oh, 
Trevor and Jaden. Oh. One of those is for me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. Water all over there. Where's Tia? She's done. She's been done an hour. She finished an hour ago. Honest? An hour ago. An hour ago. 26 mile marker. So finish. Son of boy and dad. Good job, Dad. Finish line, Dad did it again. Good job. Oh, man. I was waiting for you. Oh, There's a family. Hi, my boy. Hi, boy. What's up, Grandpa? All right. Thank you. Okay. Oh, wait, hold it. I'm going to the shower, and then I come out. Okay? And then Grandpa will come out over there. Come on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You just straight beat him. You took him to the, took him to school. He been waiting for me. Right. I don't think so. He didn't look like he was waiting up there on Snow Canyon Hill. He said she's way back there. Yeah, and I wasn't even back there. I was way. <laughs> he got nervous. <laughs> Good job, Tia. <laughs> and Sunny Boy said, oh, yeah. Tia, yeah. look at this. Play a hater. Yeah. Well, the way you ran last week, too. Play a hater. She was saving it for the marathon. Why waste it on a fake thing? Hey, Max. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's up? Hey, Max. Oh, dang. There's Dad. The time is I told you. Five fifty nine. Hey. What? Be over here. Oh. Hold on, hold on. You see what Dad gave Tia? Dad gave Tia the money. Tia, now what are you going to do with all that money?
This is October 5th, 1999, and the grass is just about coming through. As you can see, it took about nine days. Last week, Monday, they sprayed it on my birthday, September 27th, 1999. And nine days after, you can see the the grass coming through. Take a real close shot. Can't wait to have all that grass. Be able to look back here and see it all green. is barely coming through but it's starting to take place this is what under the trees look like as you can see the grass coming a little bit of the grass Coming up. Little by little. Now on this other side. You can see it. Barely coming out. Just trying to keep it moist. Not to put too much water. We don't want to chase the seeds away. But we've got to keep the ground moist and not too much water so you don't rot the grass. But seems to be coming up pretty good. That's what it looked nine days after they sprayed. It is October 5th, Okay, and this hole here is where the, the drip, we should have made that a little bit deeper, with bigger rocks and so the thing would go down into the ground. Now live and learn, I have to redo that here, as we can see the grass is coming. Very slow, but it's there. See it? Little by little, nine days after the spray. See, there's some right there. Over there, never had grass before. And then uh, there's some right there. Yes, you just got to be patient with this type of grass. It's not like sod where you can just have it in one day. 
takes about maybe a month for the grass will be real heavy as you can see in the backyard. It's coming slowly. Today is Saturday, October 9th, 1999, 13 days after we shot the, the backyard with the seeds, and this is what it looks like, and we're just keeping it damp, and beautiful weather we're having, so the grass is coming in slowly. But surely, and it's really looking nice. Really looking nice. As you can see, all those little grass. Ooh, I'm so happy. We got a grass. It's coming in. That's what it looks like over here on the side. It's coming in slowly. It's 13 days since the time we've shot it with the seeds. And this is what it looks like. And it's coming up, but we're just keeping it damp and the grass is coming through little by little, as you can see. As you look back there, that's what it looks like from the backyard. As we look back, and you can see all the grass finally coming through. Look up there now. See all that. That's grass. <laughs> Very nice. Looking really, really nice. Can't wait for it to get thick. Okay. The other sprinkler just kicked on. There it is, going crazy. Little by little, it's getting there. There's a side yard being watered.
This is the 13th day. 13th day, and the grass is coming through pretty good. I'm just going to keep it moist and watered. 13 days. And this is what it looks like. And today is October the 9th, me and mom's anniversary, and this is our gift to each other, the grass in our backyard. 31 years. 31 beautiful years. And today Max took us out to lunch, him and Sunshine and Jaden. And Rhea, can't forget Rhea. Rhea was there too. And we went to Panda Garden in St. George. And after that we went to 31 Flavors. And then to see Max's snake at the, at the, uh, the dance club. Got a brand new snake. And we wanted to see it. Um, Dad went to work today, six hours on Saturday, for our anniversary. But we enjoyed it. And I love Mama very much. 31 years, and she's the best. Aloha. Oh, who's that guy watching? Hmm. It's me. Ha <laughs> ha. October 17th. I just want to make a fast shot of this. With all the grass. Now the grass is growing. And we just had a wind windstorm yesterday. And oh, we got some palm trees. And we just got these palm trees from Tony, Tony Hoyt, who is sells these. And this is what the grass looks like. Grass is coming in very beautifully. And Uncle David and his family is coming today to visit us. So Uncle David came up and uh, Uncle David came up and he got into senior games, the 5K walk. And I heard he won a medal. All right, good for Uncle David. Uh huh. And it's coming slowly but surely. This is Alquin's backyard with our palm trees. Just put that in yesterday. And it's almost been a month now since we've put the seeds down, and that's where the grass is at. Over and out. Aloha. Up there in the, in the green down there, that'll be perfect little sandwich. <laughs> 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 Looks like a little golf course. Uncle <laughs> David came to visit us. Yeah, you remember Dara? Yes, I remember Dara. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been a while. This is wonderful, uh, Clayton. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've done a beautiful job. Beautiful. Yeah. You did all the cement work too? Yeah, all this wow. over here, all the rock wall. You see, I had guys come in and help me with the sidewalk.
and they were living in St. They were living in St. George and Oh, you did a beautiful job. How are you? Fine. Fine. Yeah. And you live in Ivan. I live in Ivan. Yeah. The other side of the new one. Yeah. Ivan. Ivan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we went there. Oh, huh? No. Uh -huh. Right past there. Come on. Oh, beautiful day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm having a special family home evening tonight. We're on with David. I love you. I'll take a picture first, and the next one you can take. Just sit right there. I don't care. Yeah. Let's go down. This is all the family. Okay. <laughs> More sun. I need to get a flash. How am I going to get a flash? Are you? Right. Clayton? Yeah. yeah. Well, you too. Right. Yeah. Come on, Mr. Where you get over here? Of course, you don't get over here. I'll go by this. Yeah. Right here, over here for a minute. And then you can pick up Uncle David and all of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know my face, but I don't know. Stand on the chair, Tia. One, two, three. All right. Irene. Good, Jake. Irene, can you sit here with me? We, uh, we put together a very interesting uh, history of our family. And uh, last April, uh, as you know, the, uh, uh, the 10 of us in our family, we have a half-sister by the name of me. And uh, that was for my mom, my my dad, and my dad had a, this uh, daughter from uh, a Simon lady that uh, Boy, he and my mother were married. And then my mother had nine kids of her own. So last April, it was in February that uh, Papua called me from New York. He said, Uncle David, could you help me? We went and put together something for our dad on his uh, 88th birthday. So I got down and I sent him some things, some pictures. And uh, then after that, I said, yeah, I want to do the same thing with my brother Max. Um, Joyce. So uh, <clears throat> that's what I have over here. I'm not going to uh, to read, because uh, I leave a copy with your mom and grandma, and I, I read and think. Is that what you want me to do? Yeah. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so it's. Um, uh, the 12 pages all together, and uh, we're not. We're just going to concentrate on your grandfather. And he cared to me to keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great history, though. I'm reading through it. If you get a chance yet, you'll have a copy. Of the history of, uh, of this family is incredible. Just incredible. And I want to thank Salofi for. Uh, we started uh, with uh, Leonard and David in uh, uh, Lehigh and uh, American Corps. And then Howard brought his uh, computer with him and he, he uh, did quite a few. And then Salon, he uh, took the, uh, the disc and well, he just put all this together. So Salon, thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. Okay, so uh, 
I think we skipped the one that uh, fell off the continuum. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> let me just read just a part over here. And I, we want to maintain the interest of the children. This is the personal history of the, Han of the family of Gustav Tafel and Rosie Young Hanneman. Now, these are my parents. This is also Max's parents, your grandfather. My father, Gustav Tafel Hanneman, was born on April the 18th, 1881, in Vimeo, in Fort Western Samoa. He was a son of Gustav Herman Albert Hanneman, who was born on May the 23rd, 1852, in Jacobs Hagen, Pomerania, Prussia. Prussia was uh, Germany, because of Prussia. And Bogatula Fata Alini was born about 1857 in the village of Alawa, the island of the Western Samoa. There were two brothers, Max, the oldest, my dad, Gustav, and one sister, Griffith. Uh, my, uh, my brother, my, my dad and his brother, uh, their dad took them to Germany at so about five years of age. And uh, they went to school in Germany. And then Germany always had a compulsory military training. And this compulsory military training uh, was kind of a choice of which branch of the service you want to join. So my dad chose to join the German Navy and his brother Marx. We never called him Max, we always called him Marx. He went to the uh, German Army. And then my dad took a cruise around the world. And he came to Samoa, met my mom, and he came back after his enlistment and got married. But uh, Uncle Max never came back to Samoa. And then my mother was corresponding with him until the outbreak of the Second World War. We lost contact with him. And when Mary was in Germany on a mission, uh, Marion did a lot of uh, genealogical research. And she got on the Hunnaman line, did way back to about 1600, 1500. Did a tremendous job. Marion is, I think it's the genealogy of our family. And, uh, so I'm just going to skip that. And uh, my mother, uh, his father was, uh, my mother's name was Rosie Young. And uh, her father, his father, Stephen, Tao Young. They used to refer to him as Captain Young. Because he used to go to San Francisco and uh, buy a sailboat. And he would part it in Samoa. And uh, there are two Samoans. American and Western Samoa, and from port to port is 80 miles one way. And he opened up the first commerce in the two Samoans. And uh, it's a very interesting story about, about my grandfather, your great grandfather. But we're going to skip all of that because um, you'll have a copy of it. But let's um, uh, get in town here too. And then, um, the second page, it says about my mom and my dad, and how my uh, father was in the German Navy, and then uh, they got married. Uh, my mom's 22nd birthday, September the 5th, 1908. See, how, how many years ago was that? 1901, huh? So my parents were there, uh, been there for 91 years. And uh, I have a copy of the original uh, marriage license in German. Beautiful penman, penmanship. My father, my, my mom's dad, gave my mother as a wedding gift a store. Now in Samoa, the stores in Samoa, they, they sell uh, hardware. You know, just like you go to a hardware store. They sell hardware, they sell clothing and shoes, they sell uh, groceries. And so my father gave my mother, my grandfather gave my mother a wedding gift of a store. And then when the, second, when the First World War broke out, all the Germans, full blood Germans and part Germans, they were taken to New Zealand to a concentration camp. 
for the duration of the First War, from 1914, 1918. But my grandfather, who was a, who was a British subject, he petitioned the British government, who then have taken over Western Samoa at the outbreak of the First World War, and uh, requested if my dad, being uh, part German, not to be taken to New Zealand to the concentration camp, but let him remain in Western Samoa, which was formerly German Samoa, under his custody. And they granted his request. So, so throughout the war, my dad worked for my mom. And then after the war, and some of the Germans were teasing my dad, saying, you know, why don't you let Rosie wear the pants and you wear the skirt? You're looking for that English girl, you know. Well, my dad, my mom, thought after the war to keep the peace of the family, she gave the store to my dad for a buck. But then my dad turned right around and sold it to Mr. Carruthers, who had a crush on my mother. And my mother never liked him because we all his teeth and ticklers. <laughs> but anyway, and then. <coughs> My, my dad had a store. Uh, I, uh, so here, there are 10 of us children in our family of six brothers and four sisters, including my half-sister, Nii Hanuman Samoa. That's, uh, that's Becca's mom. I will include Nii's biography and history of her tree in the next class of this personal history of the family Augusta Taku and Rosie Young Hanuman prepared our lesson the 83rd anniversary of the birth of my sister Joyce Love Love Choir, the seventh child. And so last week on October the 8th, we started this. So in commemoration of my sister uh, Joyce's 88th anniversary of her birth. Now, <clears throat> One, my elder sister, Nii Hanuman Samoa, her biography and history of her children will be in the next draft of our family history. And that will be on January the 1st, 2000. And two, second one is my sister Margaret, she born on December the 23rd, 1909. The third is my oldest brother, Gustav, Arthur Tapu Tupolo III was born on April the 3rd, 1911. And you know, all these kids, you know, Mufi and Nephi and Gus for them, you know. And then uh, the fourth child is Francis, who was born on May 18, 1912. On July the 17, 1925, my brother Francis died suddenly at the tender age of 13 from injuries sustained when he was hit by a speeding bicycle. The accident happened as he and his friend Hans Kyle were walking across the street returning to the classroom from the waterfront during their lunch period. He was a bright student attending the prestigious Catholic Murray's Brother School for Boys in Savalon. My brother's untimely death was indeed a shock to my parents. They were greatly saddened and despondent. The agony they suffered was almost too much to bear. Within a month, my mother's black hair turned gray. Francis was hit by the son of the chief of police. The government was willing to pay anything to reach a settlement, but my parents didn't accept their offer because it would be like selling their son. The chief's son was subsequently sent away from Samoa to New Zealand as a compromise. Now the first child of ten children, and I will read and you can read another picture, was Max Seuli, born on November 29, 1913, in Lotapa Upolu, Western Samoa. He married Irene Doe of Pongo Pongo to Creel American Samoa on Christmas Day, 1935. And Mapusaka to Creel American Samoa.
They have 11 daughters and three sons. My brother Max died on April 23rd, 1973. My sister-in-law, Irene Doe, died on January the 6th, 1993. And the oldest son, Max Jr., died in January 1990. And they recited Torrance, California. <laughs> 19, yeah. My brother Max, uh, whenever you want to, then you can, I take turns. Whenever you're ready, you just tell me that you'd like to read the next prayer. Okay? My brother Max used to take my father's rifle to hunt wild ducks, birds, and wild boar behind our property. Max became quite a marksman with a rifle. One of my fond memories of my brother Max is when I was five years old and I accompanied him hunting for birds, <coughs> especially the marutani, which our dad craved for dinner. This was when dad was quite ill, just before he was admitted to the Mototua General Hospital. The Samoans used to say that when a person is sick and quite <coughs> ill, as our dad was, and craved certain foods, is not a good sign. It means that death is imminent <coughs> or simply a sign of near death. On the night my father passed away, Max took the rifle, <coughs> went in front of our house, and fired 21 shots in the air. That was how Max announced to the community that our father had passed away, an approximate 21 gun salute. Max was also a professional boxer. Can you read the next one? No, you read okay. it. Max was very fond of bicycles. Oh, this is a personal experience I had with him. In fact, he owned one of the biggest models built by Harley Davidson in those days, 1937. I was about 11 years old when I rode with him on his bike, sitting directly behind him with my arms wrapped around his waist with my eyes closed for fear of my life. <laughs> I didn't like it, but I just went to please him. We were traveling on a straight road from Malifa towards our home in Baimosa. However, as we approached the four corners near Ifi Ifi School, where I attended, that's where I got my PhD from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, road, the road curves toward the left. Max, I believe, miscalculated his distance and went straight ahead into the bushes. Needless to say, I was scared to death and I suffered severe wounds on both legs. It was the dusk and visibly, visibility was poor. I have never ridden a motorcycle since and I have no regrets whatsoever. <laughs> My mother and I used to travel inter-island by boat frequently between Western Samoa and West and American Samoa, a distance of 80 miles one way. We had family members and relatives living in both Samoa. We always maintained permanent residence in Western Samoa uh, until after the until after the Second World War ended in 1945, when we moved to American Samoa permanently. Our visits, however, our visits to American Samoa were for longer periods of time, and usually lasted for several months, and sometimes over a year or so. We would rotate staying with family members, but quite often with Max and Irene, in the town of Fangatongo, which was also the capital of American Samoa. <laughs> Max was the manager <coughs> of Ben Phillips General Store, one of the biggest department stores in the South Pacific, which sold almost anything from hardware, groceries, dry goods, etc. The store was located on the first floor and living quarters were on the top floor of the stately and comfortable two-story building in town. 
One of the American staff bar, I attended the Catholic Murray's Brothers Private School in the village of Atu'u across the beautiful Pango Pango Bay. The U.S. Navy provided transportation for the students to and from school in their small naval class. An experience I had with my brother one morning was quite amusing. I really didn't want to go to school on this particular day, so I soaked my shoes in the tub of water as a legitimate excuse why I couldn't go to school without my shoes. Max was furious and was determined I go to school regardless what. After he examined my shoes and made several attempts to dry them, the last resort being to bring the oven to no avail, he went into the store and found a new pair of shoes my size and sent me off to school with a scolding that was not pleasant at all. <laughs> you want to read? No, I like My brother Max, <laughs> when he left home and moved to American Samoa, wrote to mother regularly. And most always had a package of groceries he ordered to my mother every month without fail. Max continued doing this long after he was married and in actuality supported two families. My brother could not have given generously without the support of his devoted wife, Irene. That's very touching. When I was, when I was uh, putting this down, I, I couldn't have my tears because uh, when my dad died, mother with eight children, and it was very difficult for a widow, and I believe mom years of age, and so Max was always very thoughtful. He would write to mother very faithful, every time it's a letter from mom. <coughs> and then, of course, as I said, he would send groceries, but every month my mother would get that and she would cry, and she would say something like this, my loving son, the order of my loving son. So, can never forget that. I hear something very interesting. I don't keep a journal, but I, I'm blessed with a good memory. I could just I remember very, very well because I got involved with what, what I'm going to share with you in this chapter. In 1941, upon residing as Fred Phillips store manager, Max was 27 years of age. In 1941, upon residing as Fred Phillips store manager, Max left American Samoa for San Francisco. California and Hawaii, shortly before the outbreak of the Second World War, seeking better opportunities for his family. His plans were that as soon as he finds a job and suitable accommodations for his family, he would send for them. Max became homesick and abruptly went back to Samoa without notice that he was returning home so soon. During his return trip to Samoa on the Matson luxury line of Matsonia, he met a fellow passenger on board by the name of Evan C. Williams from San Francisco. This gentleman was a prominent member of the CD, as, may, as Max later learned about him. The CB's coach coach was a unique group of highly skilled civilian blue-collar workers and professionals in military uniforms assembled by the U.S. Navy into a construction organization authorized by the U.S. government to build military installations overseas. This group was being dispatched to Samoa to build the first airport in the islands 
and other essential military installations, such as barracks for U.S. troops, commissary, food service facilities, hospital, etc., etc. Mr. Williams was the refrigeration and air conditioning engineer in charge of this phase of construction. Mr. Williams and Max became very well acquainted to learn about each other and their diverse backgrounds. While they developed a close, they developed a close friendship. In fact, it was like a father and son relationship while traveling together for almost five days. This 27-year-old handsome young man of Samoan English German ancestry was perhaps the first Polynesian Mr. Williams met. He offered Max a job in the refrigeration and air conditioning section of the CB's construction organization over which he was in charge as chief engineer. He undoubtedly must have been tremendously impressed with my brother's demeanor, an inherent combination of Samoan hospitality and spirituality, a Naga Aloha or Aloha spirit, and the German can do attitude and industriousness. Max worked with Mr. Williams, his mentor, during the entire duration of the war, from 1941 to 1945, as an apprentice and advanced to the ranks to mechanic journeyman and supervisor. He was the first local refrigeration air conditioning mechanic in both American and Western Samoa. He also took <coughs> a correspondence file course in this new vocation and was recognized by his peers and community as an outstanding craftsman. He was instrumental in bringing Brother Chris to work with him during the war. He hired me shortly after the war. He became our mentor, and we are forever grateful to him for including us in this new vocation in our lives. Chris and I assisted Max when he was hired by Sam Scanlon to install the very first commercial ice cream and soda fountain in American Samoa at a scanning store in Tamatomo. This new and exciting enterprise took place immediately after the war. Max finally left American Samoa for Hawaii in 1946 to pursue his dream for better opportunities for his family. Now that was five years the first time that he went, and he abruptly returned to Samoa. And then five years later, he went to um, Hawaii in 1946. There was a demand for skilled refrigeration and air conditioning mechanics at the Pearl Harbor Union Naval Shipyard. He was hired immediately, and the Navy provided him with accommodation for his family civilian housing, CHHC, adjacent to military housing. It was a dream come true with blessings, joy and happiness for a wonderful couple with seven beautiful daughters that eventually increased to 11 daughters and three sons with one exceeding a famous cousin. <laughs> Max joined the U.S. Naval Reserve while employed at the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. He enlisted full-time service in the Navy in 1953 until he retired of disability with his heart condition in 1955. It was a distinguished career from 1941 to 1955, a total of 14 years as a skilled refrigeration and air conditioning specialist. <clears throat> now, I find it amazing that my brother Max abruptly left Hawaii for Samoa 
so soon in 1941. Why? Because if he had not returned to Samoa, he would have been stranded in Hawaii under the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Sunday, December 7, 1941. And he would have been separated from his family for four years until the end of the war in 1945. I also find it amazing that Max would travel on a maximum luxury liner Matsodia instead of another ship and at that particular time. Why? So he can meet Mr. Evan C. Williams. I sincerely believe the Lord had a hand in these developments, which blessed my brother with a new lifelong career in refrigeration and air conditioning. Now, I have the bottom. More to come on his 87th anniversary of his birth, November the 29th, the year 2000. How about a round of applause? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah. Now, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. Because when Max came to Hawaii with, his, with Irene and the children, by the way, I said seven daughters. There were six daughters. Then while they were in Hawaii, they gave birth to, uh, to four more children. And uh, uh, Irene and uh, Joyce were born in Hawaii. Lina, Irene, and Yeah, Lina, Irene, and, Irene, and Joyce. Junior. Junior. And Joyce became the ninth Daughter. girl before they had a son. And then when they moved to California, they gave birth to uh, uh, four more children. Yeah, Arthur, Patricia, Lloyd, and Marshall. Three boys and one girl. Now, when Max came to uh, Hawaii in 1946, beside his family, his mother, and his brothers and sisters, especially yours truly, he really wants me to come to home, to home. And So my mother arranged for a passage for me on a, on a, on a troop ship that was formerly a, a Madison line, the regular troop ship. And the ship was taken from Australia and New Zealand, full of war brides. And uh, it was on March the 4th, 1947. I was 20 years of age. My mother cried. And, oh, I'm so, I'm going to miss you. But I'm going to go to Max and Irene. Max was more than a brother to me. He was just like my, my dad. You see what his kid brother to do. Well, while my mother was crying, this Australian war bride walked over. She said to my mother, don't worry about your son. I'll take care of him. Cheer up, chap. Cheer up, chap. <laughs> Arrived in San Francisco on the 14th of uh, March. It was so cold that I want to go to Hawaii. And who did I go see to help me? It was Mr. Williams. And uh, Max sent me the address. He said, when you get to San Francisco, if you need any help, go see Mr. Williams. So I went up to his home. I, I think I got a taxi. I drove up to the avenue. It was a beautiful home. And I met Mr. Williams again, because we worked with him during the war. He introduced me to his wife and his son. And uh, had a nice visit and a nice uh, lunch. And then I said to Mr. Williams, Mr. Williams, I am very cold. I want to go to Hawaii. <laughs> and he turned to his son and he said, I forgot his son's name. Huh? He asked his son, can you help David <coughs> get to Hawaii? And he just so happened he was an executive 
Pan American. So he arranged for my, he told me where to come. It's on Market Street, not very far from the hotel where I was staying. So I walked over there, and he told me what time to come. He got my, my, my ticket, and then he says, uh, you can ride in the Pan American limo to the airport to get your flight. So I rode the limo to the airport. I got out of the airport, I went back and picked up my bag, and this black fellow <coughs> took the bag and said, I take it. And I want to take it back. I take the bag. Oh, how kind. <laughs> so he took the bag into the, you know, inside the terminal, and he just stood there. <laughs> and then I can't see, you know, you are, you call your impulse, sir. Huh? You so he must be what you call a tip. That's the first time in my life I tip anyone. So I reached in my pocket, I don't know, I made, Maybe it was about a quarter of dents or whatever. So I gave it to him. I think it's about 35 cents. Anyway, I got in a plane. And uh, I wore a suit that my mother made for me. My mother was a very good seamstress and also a tailor. And she taught my sisters, Margaret and Joyce. My sister V was not interested. She was a secretary. She didn't want to do that. Mm. But anyway, I was sitting in a plane and, and uh, next to uh, another individual. <coughs> and the man turned to me and he says, Are you Hawaiian? I said, No, I'm Samoan. <gasps> my name is Alfred Apaka. Alfred Apaka, oh my God. Yes, Alfred Apaka's dad, you know. Oh, yeah. He was in the legislature. He introduced me to another lady very popular in Hawaii, uh, Flora K. Hayes. And uh, they returning to Hawaii, where they lobbied for statehood in Washington, D.C. And became very well acquainted. Well, you know how long it took for the plane from, from uh, it took five days, no, 10 days for the boat from Samoa to San Francisco. It took almost 10 hours <coughs> on the plane from San Francisco to Honolulu, almost 10 hours. It was about nine and three quarters hours. So as soon as I arrived, I walked in the terminal, I, the next uh, public phone, I called my brother. Hey, where are you calling from? I'm calling here from Honolulu Airport. What are you doing there? It was supposed to be in San Francisco. And I said, it was so cold. <laughs> and, you, and you just got on the plane and come? How come if anything happened? We would have known you on the plane. <coughs> I said, well, I didn't have time to. I was so cold. <laughs> but Mr. Williams, <laughs> Mr. Williams wanted me to convey his best regards <coughs> to you. Oh, did you see Mr. Williams? Yeah, you told me to look him up. And it was his son at the race of my package, my, my fear to hold. Anyway because I learned refrigeration from my brother Max. <coughs> he already arranged with his boss that when his kid brother arrived, I have a job. So I was hired and to work with my brother. That was in uh, March 1947, 20 years ago. So we worked in Pearl Harbor. And then, uh, we had Christmas there. Then I had a strong desire to go to Utah, to go to the United States. I always wanted to go to the United States and go to, to Salt Lake City, go to Zion. So I, I said to my brother and I read at the dinner table one night, I, uh, I think I'm going to go to California, to San Francisco. I'm familiar with San Francisco. I look into it and I can take the bus way out of Salt Lake. And my brother said, Who do you know in Salt Lake? I don't need to know anybody. I just call my own. When you go there, you don't know anybody? Nah, you shouldn't. So when he left the table, my sister in law, Irene, said to me, You go. 
so many people. Mm. See, when you travel on the Matson liner, they can only see so many people at, at a time for the meal. The first, first seating, second seating. The ocean, just the configuration of the shoreline. And everything. Yeah, first And that's the leopard colony, all the leopard people? Oh, yeah. Are they still there? Yeah. Not too now many the, left. The king of Hawaii, you know, uh, Hawaii was the United States in 1889. But Hawaii during the monarchy, the king of Hawaii, you know, I really uh, appreciate what he did. He uh, established a leper colony in the Kalaupapa Peninsula uh, in Molokai. And then the old county, Colorado County. It's the most beautiful place in Hawaii. Now, the king promised them, if you come to Molokai, you can live there the rest of your life. And so, Hawaii then became the United States territory, became a state, and now it's a national, uh, you know, uh, monument is taking here. It's not kept by the, oh, no, no, by the uh, National Forest Service. But they still honor that commitment. There are two members of the church that I knew for my mission. It's Lucy Kaona. She went there when she was 15. She's now 75. She's cured, but she's been disfigured, you know. I mean, you can tell her face. You, you got to see her? Huh? You got to see her when you were there. She back. took us oh, around yeah. on a tour. Yeah. They the took us people, around. Us too. The one that he met on his mission? Yeah. Oh my God. And then Kule Bell, she was only eight years of age when she came to Kalapapa. Uh, she's 65. She's also the sheriff. And they drove us around on the side scene of Kalapapa. That's interesting. Anyway, so when I, then my mission, it was over in 1951, uh, uh, and I stopped in Honolulu on my way back to Salt Lake City. And I renamed me her. Uh, this time, my brother was in the. Uh, oh, I made a mistake. My brother joined the uh, uh, went into the forest. Uh, I said 51, it's 52, it's 51. Because when I, when I, you know, when I stop over to visit them, she gave me her check. It was a hundred dollar check from the Navy. Oh, his, his check. Well, no, your father remained his own paycheck, but the wife get a separate, the oh, husband allowed or something. She gave it to me, and then she says, "Now, see, take this with you, pocket money." And then Rosie and Eleanor. He used to send me money on my mission when they did the same. So, and then I went to Salt Lake City, returned to Hawaii, and then my mother, my brother Max and I, then together we planned to have my mother come from Samoa. So mother came from Samoa in 1952. And, and also at the same time, my, my brother Gus, I read it just like a mom. And you just like my dad. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being a good husband to my niece. Because if you weren't, I would. <laughs> 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 
I would, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, I would curse you as a <laughs> That's why he's doing the radio. You are, you are great. Thank you very much. Well, I just like to say thank you. You've been the light of our life every time we, we went to Hawaii and every time we came to California oh, yeah. to your home with all your children. Aloha means Uncle David. Every time we said aloha, we told him Uncle David. Because, uh, your spirit is well known throughout the world through people we meet, people that go over and meet you, the Parker Center. They come back with nothing but the spirit of aloha. We're so grateful And we appreciate you so much. I dare say a couple more words. I got one thing I wanted to share with everybody, and it's from Uncle Max, your brother. And I want to share a little bit on what he left with me, and, uh, the things that he did. I just wanted to relate this to you folks, that uh, the, day, the day I was, I remember when Grandma was living by herself, and uh, she asked me if I could come and uh, take a look at her roof. And I was living up in Cucamonga. And so I told Grandma that I would be down there as soon as I could break away from, you know, all the things that I was involved with, my kids and everything, and working. And, and so I meant to get down to Grandma. You were just called Bishop. No, not yet. Oh. And then, uh, then I was called to become a bishop. And then. Uh, they gave me a couple of days to think about it because I felt bad. I felt real bad because Grandma asked me to come take a look at her roof and I didn't even make it down to my mother-in-law's house and I felt real bad. And I said, I would get back with you folks when I take care of certain things. So one Saturday I went down there and I got on the roof and Grandma wasn't home and she went out with Auntie Eleanor. And so I jumped up on the roof Pulled the roof off all by myself, got the things and fixed all the roof and get everything all done and all of that. And during the time that I was up on the roof, I asked my wife, it was getting dark, and I said, can you go find an extension, an extension cord so I can run a light up here so I can see. And so my wife was inside their bedroom, and I'm in grandma's bedroom looking through and trying to see if she could find an extension. So sweet. And she ran across these books. These are like diaries kept from uh, Grandma. And uh, Green was going through them and she brought it on. She said, honey, look at this. Look what Grandpa, Grandpa left. And uh, I looked at it. We put it away. And then when Grandma came home, she said, nobody found those books inside there after Grandpa died. And uh, when I asked Mom, but my wife, for an extension, I felt like the, the extension came from heaven down to earth. <laughs> but we need to find this so that when I become a bishop, I could be able to use it when I was serving. And as I served as a bishop, I went through all those because Grandma came to me later and told me, Clay, this is for you. I said, Mom, uh-uh, this is for the kids. No, this is for you. And I looked at her and I said, I can't believe this. And she said, I want to give this to you. And she said, Daddy wanted you to find it. Because Daddy, when I became in a family, Daddy used to stay up at 2 o'clock in the morning with me. And he talked to me, and he teach me about the priest, and uh, it really meant a lot to me. 
And uh, when I got this stuff, these, these, everything that Dad did, he, he made notes of everything. Mm -hmm. And scriptures, and, and sayings, and quotes. But this one here stands out really a lot because it's in his own handwriting. Okay? And I found this, and I keep it right in the front here because I know my father-in-law was a man of 14 children. He raised three jobs, jobs he worked to provide for his family. But I wanted to read to you folks what he wrote down on this piece of paper that he never thought would become as important as it is in my life. Because this is what I found. Because I honor his words and what he taught me. And uh, it says over here, Desire to serve God. If we would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, consider, consider personal affairs as secondary. Consider first the work of God. The Lord said, I am bound if ye do what I say, but if ye do not what I say, ye have no promise. Also said, if you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> Be willing to magnify our respective <coughs> callings. And in DNC 107, 99, 100, wherefore now let every man learn his duty. The gospel of love. And on the back here, he wrote down, it says, should work together with the love should work together in the love and the spirit of love and cooperation. And this was what left for my, for my father. And then I look at this, and today I just wanted to leave a short message with you folks, and it's from our first presidency of the church. A town from villages that we now reverently call the Holy Land and taught his disciples by beautiful Galilee. He often spoke in parables, in language the people understood best. Frequently, he referred to home building in relationship to the lives of those who, who listened. He declared, every house divided against itself shall not stand. Later, he cautioned, behold, my house is a house of order and not a house of confusion. In revelation given through the prophet Joseph Smith at Kirkland, Ohio, December 27, 1832, the master council organized a, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. Where could any of us locate a more suitable blueprint whereby we could wisely and properly build a house to personally <laughs> occupy throughout eternity? Such a house would meet the building code outlined in Matthew. Even, if, even a house built upon a rock, a house capable of withstanding the rains of adversity, the floods of opposition, and the winds of doubt, everywhere present in our challenging world. Let our house be a house of fasting. Our house is to be a house of faith. James recorded, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and afraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Once <laughs> <or> more. <laughs> keep going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Everyone sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Practice your zippity doo dogs. I want your kids to get on video. Yeah. <laughs>
trophy that dad won for the pie eating contest at the Walmart picnic in October 16, 1999 and now it's got to be given back to the department. This is what it looked like.